you know, let's just take pride yeah. that we can have a small business. Freaking yeah, it. for all, it is called the American dream. The message we do have is stay calm and know the facts. Some companies may be claiming bankruptcy. It doesn't mean always that their doors are shut. They may be reorganizing. So what you want to do is get the facts. So I always start there. So when any of you are thinking, I want to put away the most money in my 401k, you got to start with your baseline of how much payroll do I really have to take to begin with? Welcome everyone to the Main Street Business Podcast with Mark Holder and Matt Sorensen. We are delighted to be with you today in the open forum episode. This is this is the people's show. This episode where we filled your tax and legal questions, building wealth, saving money on taxes, all that good stuff. Um, we try to fill some other questions, but if you stay in that lane, you're going to have a lot more success. Yeah, that's right. We're going to give you <laughs> a lot better answers uh, rather than your questions about life. But uh, this is for you, you main streeters in America. It's so awesome, Matt. I was driving here to the studio and on the country station, it was noon and they said, it's time to play. They do it every day at noon. They play the national anthem. And I was just like, you know what? <laughs> I love America, you know? Only small town America, country station yeah. is going to do that. And it, that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it's too bad. I, I know that many of you that might be on either side of the aisle and it gets frustrating with a lot of politics going on in the Supreme Court right now and everything. Sometimes we just have to sit back and go, you know what? With all the different arguments out there and issues, America's still pretty cool. And it's okay to listen to the yeah. national anthem. It doesn't mean yeah. right side or left side is right or wrong or bad. we got a pretty cool country. And so it's 4th of July mm -hmm. week. I just want to say welcome to everybody. You know, let's just take pride yeah. that we can have a small business. Yeah, for all it is called the American dream. Yeah, I mean, gee, yeah, it's the American dream. To I don't know, for some people, I think that's like owning your own home or um, maybe being financially secure. For other people, it's just living in a cool country or owning a small business. Yep, yep, yep. Now, also lots of other things in the news this week. There's some companies are claiming bankruptcy. You know, in different sectors, and uh, Matt and I are not here to tell you to, boy, stay on, pull out, whatever. Lots of different things happen in a recession. Different companies come and go. And we want to be careful not to help any of you lose your money further by telling you something we shouldn't. <laughs> so we're just going but, to... But the message we do have is stay calm and know the facts. Just, just stay calm, study, learn, look at trends. And... It, Acting irrationally when things are heated or happening quickly is oftentimes not the right move. Uh, and that's not giving any crazy financial advice. So I want to give an example here, Matt. Yeah. What am, what am I holding? For those on YouTube, you see this, but. <laughs> that's a Twinkie. It has not been eaten yet, surprisingly. Well, yeah, yeah. It, I've been waiting for this you show. To... Eat that on camera? <laughs> oh, yeah. What, what am I now doing with this Twinkie? Mm. Oh, yeah. You eat that turkey, you know that. Gonna, I, I, I even have a glass of milk with me to help wash it oh down. Mm. It was wow. really good. Now, here's what I want to tell everybody this Twinkie represents something. It's called bankruptcy law. Now, back in 2004, <laughs> Twinkie, we thought we were never going to get a Twinkie again. Guys, it was he's all going over. somewhere with this. He's going somewhere with I'm this. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm hang gonna, in there. Hang in there. Yeah, I'm going to eat the rest of this Twinkie, is where I'm going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in. 2004, Twinkie claimed bankruptcy, and everybody thought, we got to go buy Twinkies. Now, they did have a shelf life of like 80 years, so we thought, let's load up. Uh, no, <laughs> But anyway, we thought we'd never have another Twinkie in our lives again, but they claimed what is called Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which gives companies five years to get their crap together. A trustee comes in and says, whoa, 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 creditors, you can't come in and shut things down, and let's find out what's in the bank, and let's figure things out. So bankruptcy law... It's called a Chapter 11 reorg. This is what companies do to say, "Hey, we're we're drowning here. We need we need a timeout." You know, it's kind of when your kids on, when you're a little kid, your brother be on and you're pounding and you're on the chest and you're like, "Timeout!" You know, so <laughs> bankruptcy is kind of like you get a breather to kind of put things together. So as you see out in different industries during the recession, some companies may be claiming bankruptcy. It doesn't mean always that their doors are shut. They may be reorganizing. So what you want to do is get the facts, study up, learn. See what's going on. And, and that's the benefit of a Chapter 11 bankruptcy so that we as consumers don't 
stockholders, shareholders, customers, whatever it may be, we don't make rash decisions and make it worse for ourselves, acting like a mob and just being crazy. So Matt, any yeah. thoughts? Touch yeah. the subject. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just going to let that, that, that stick. Let, just let it lie. You know, just let it, let lie. it lie. All right. I love I'm gonna, it. So let's get into your guys' questions though. Um, and why not start off with a great question from Lee Richter. Oh, got to love Reed. Got to love Reed. Long time listener. He says, I have a single member S Corp. So he's, I guess, what he means, sole owner of an S Corporation with okay. a 401k. I have one part time worker that might put in 10 hours a month doing my billing. I wanted to confirm what I thought I heard you say a few weeks back about 401ks and part time workers. Did you say that the rule chain mm -hmm. not work part time for over three years, no matter how many hours they work? where the owner can still have a solo 401k. All right. Let me clarify that and answer Lee's question. Many of you that have an S corp or self-employed can do a solo 401k, which is what Lee's talking about here. Where you have your own 401k plan. You can put in 60 grand a year. It's an awesome retirement account. You can self-direct it. You can buy real estate. You can do Roth. So many cool things. We've got lots of different podcast episodes on that. But the solo 401k only works if you have no other employees that are full-time or there's the rule change recently that are part-time that have worked for you for at least three years. So in your scenario, Lee, you may have a problem looming here if you've got someone working 10 hours a week, which is part-time, and that they end up working for you as, a, as an employee for three years. So this is going to cause an issue, unfortunately, Lee, and your solo K is once that person has been there three years, the solo K is now gonna to have to turn into a regular 401k where you're gonna to have to offer it to your employee. You can still do it for yourself, but it might have to convert <clears throat> at that time out of a solo 401k. Now you might have some options. If this is a billing or bookkeeping person, let's say, maybe it's someone you 1099, if you can legitimately do that. I mean, maybe they're not even coming into your place of work. I don't know. And let's get them off of your payroll as an actual W-2 employee. I love it, Matt. I was just gonna go there. And by the way, for those a little annoyed not by me eating a Twinkie, because I know many of you appreciate that. But if I'm coughing here, it's I'm battling the tail end of COVID. And so one of millions of Americans that gets to have the little COVID experience, even after <laughs> being vaccinated, whatever. So um, if I cough a little bit here, I'll, I'll keep drinking my water and milk here to, to help alleviate that. But I, everybody listen to what Lee said. Ten out, he used a key word. I only have one part-time worker. Notice he didn't say the word employee. We didn't say contractor or whatever. I don't know what Lee meant by that. So, and plus 10 hours a month. Oh my gosh. That looks like a 1099 bookkeeper to me. They're just doing minimum, minimal yeah. work there. And, and I've got articles on what classifies a worker as an employee versus a sub. And I think Lee, that's your escape hatch right there. So, yeah. Yep. Just you, like, you know, <laughs> I was do a, a top gun quote. I was going to say like, like Maverick and Goose with the escape hatch, but that actually didn't end well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you got to quote something from the new Top Gun because that ended well, you know. Uh, but that same thing happened, didn't it? Yeah, the but, same thing no, but, but with, no one um, died in the new Top Gun. I know, but Maverick and then Goose's son, what was his name? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I know. Boy, you spoiler alert, that? everybody. Spoiler yeah. alert. I mean, if you haven't seen, you know, Maverick, the new Top Gun by it's on now, you. Yeah. It, that's your fault. Yeah, that's true. You, you deserve to get a spoiler alert. <laughs> All right. I'm going to jump over to a question from Gerald. Uh, it says, I am a recent listener and love the podcast. Thank you, Gerald. I had a quick question concerning LLCs in regards to podcast episode 377, LLC Myths, What You Need to Know. Oh, that was so studious of him to quote an actual title of our show. Love it. What are your thoughts slash recommendations on which type of LLC structure is best suited for setting up an international consulting syndicate? No, I'm just joking. He said business. Okay. It just sounded cool. Syndicate sounded cool. Whenever you say the word international. Anyway, I live in Maryland, but would consult for both companies that are based in the U.S. as well as abroad, non-U.S. based entities. The projects would at least initially all be international projects. Thanks again. Keep up the good work. Now, some of you may think this is totally complex. Oh my gosh, he's in Maryland and he's helping international customers and clients and international consulting. <laughs> Guys, super easy answer. He's an American, living in the United States, doing business. 
in Maryland. I don't care if your customer lives on Mars, lives in Australia, lives in England, or lives in New Jersey. If you're a U.S. citizen providing services to anyone in the world or this universe, and they pay you, you have to recognize that income as a U.S. citizen. You're living in Maryland. Your butt's in Maryland. So you're going to be filing a tax return there, and you would want an S corporation. Now, if you haven't already filed your LLC, I'd go straight to an S corp, Gerald. I mean, just go straight to the heart of the matter. But if you have an LLC, you would want to do an S election when the time is right. And I'm assuming you're going to have enough income to justify the S corp, but you're just going to be an LLC tax as an S corp. I don't care where your income's coming from. You're going to have to pay self-employment tax on a regular LLC, no matter who your customers are, wherever they're at. So it, it's actually an easy answer. Yeah. Matt? Yeah. The only, the only caveat I'd add to that, Gerald, is if you had a foreign customer that's like, let's say they're in the UK and they're like, yeah, we're only going to do business with you if you come register in the UK. We don't want to do business with a foreign entity. So we want you to come register here. Now, the nice thing about the US, lots of people love dealing with US entities. They're okay with that. And you may not have to file all the way in the foreign entity, the UK or wherever it may be. So, but you may run into that if you have a customer, particularly a large corporation or something. Generally, if you're freelancing though, or stuff like that, they're not going to care. Yeah. And also I'll say, Gerald, if you start living abroad and become an, what they call an expat, where you're living the majority of the year in another country, you're going to get into a whole other realm of tax rules. But from now on, I mean, from, from what you said, you're just going to be in Maryland servicing clients around the world. So claim your income, just do your thing. Yeah. All right, All Matt. Right. Okay. All right. Galen Witt asked a great question. This is a follow-up, I think, to last week's show on Roth options and all the different ways you can get to Roth, whether it's Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks. So Galen's question was, um, as I understand it, I have three options for getting money into Roth accounts. Maybe more, but he's like, let's keep it simple. You're right. There's really three, Galen. You're, you're, you're on it. He says, my employee, my employee deferral, meaning what you can put in as an employee, Company match profit sharing, employer contributions, and for mega back Roth purposes, the after-tax non-employee contribution. I love it, Galen. You're doing great. <laughs> he says, if I understand correctly, the only one of these that avoids self-employment tax is the employer contribution. We're keeping it simple. Let me get to this question. You got another one? Well, there's number four, which is your personal Roth. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that... We're talking about the Roth. We're on the Roth solo 401k. Oh, he says, I've got a solo 401k. So there are only three ways to get it into the solo. But when, yeah. okay. But you can what, also do the backdoor Roth on top of this. Yeah. So Galen, when you talk about the mega backdoor, you're adding the bonus of the personal Roth. So don't forget that as well. So I'd say that's number four. You got the three into yeah. the solo and then the fourth being on the side. Okay. Keep going. So uh, he now, wants Galen to avoid asked self- a deep question here. Okay. He yeah. asked a tr kind of a tricky question. Um, he says, if I understand correctly, the only one of these that avoids self-employment tax is the employer contribution. Correct. Because when you make an employee deferral, or even if it's your regular Roth contribution from your, you know, your W-2, or it's the mega backdoor after tax um, uh, contribution that gets converted to Roth, that is also going to be subject. That's part of self-employment tax has to be on your W-2. So the only dollars that do not get self-employment tax on them when they're going into your Roth is the company match. So it's a, that's a great point. Now, yeah. the, there's pros and cons to this because the company match is only 25% of what your total W-2 is. So if you have 100,000, let's say on a W-2, you could only put in 25K of employer matching. But I had to pay a hundred thousand dollar W two, so I paid all that self employment tax on a hundred thousand dollar W two. So on the other hand, you could say, well, why don't I just pay myself seventy grand on my W two, and I can put that in as regular employee deferral, and the rest could be the after tax employee contribution, and I get there faster, less self employment tax. Yeah. Now this is where we have to talk about the sweet spot, and. I saw that. I, look. I, I'm talking. I, I saw that. Look. I'm talking about the sweet spot of a 401k. I don't. I unbelievable. <laughs> you know, people. I try to run a professional show here, and 
I, you know, what's funny? What I was actually going to say was, yeah. I wonder if you're going to find the same sweet spot I did. Because in this scenario, in this example, <laughs> there, there <laughs> is a one, and it's doing a, it's doing a few things here. Oh my God. We are going down the wrong path on explaining this at this point now. Okay. But <laughs> see, I, I wasn't going to go. I'm curious where you're going to, what you're going to say, because okay, I, got, here, I got an answer for this. That here, I <laughs> here's the trick on this is there's a balancing act between keeping the IRS off your back for the, for the amount of payroll you need to take. So I always start there. So when any of you are thinking, I want to put away the most money in my 401k, you got to start with your baseline of how much payroll do I really have to take to begin with? Because that's going to drive a lot of the, the, the beginning part of your equation. Because if in, you're making enough money where you're required to take 100000 in payroll, okay, let's start there. But if you're running numbers in your company and you're looking at your draws and your net income and you're like, well, I'm only required to pay about sixty grand in payroll. Okay, we'll start there. Let's start with the maximum amount of FICA you've got to take. Then what Matt and I and all of our tax attorneys are going to ask you is, how much do you have to put away? Yeah. It drives me nuts when clients are like, well, I want to put away the money. No, 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 no. You want to, and you like talking about this because it sounds cool, but how much do you really have? Well, I can only cough up 30. Okay. Well, let's figure out where we need to be to get 30 grand. So then you work backwards. And that's the sweet spot is kind of looking at how much can you put in? What's your payroll supposed to be? How much should the deferral be? And then you're trying to whoop, boom. Yeah. That's when the but magic what happens. I would, yeah. <laughs> what I would say is for Galen is go in that order of how you do it. Cause this is going to be the most efficient way for self-employment tax and everything. I like what Mark said about figuring out the right salary. Also, if you're, able to max it out 60 grand a year, you've got to have some pretty good income. And maybe you've got other income outside this entity that's helping. I go yeah. in the order, do the Roth contribution first, you know, your do, do that employee contribution first. Then do the, the employer contribution and convert to Roth. Then do the after tax. Because that employer contribution I convert to Roth, I like what Galen's saying there. It's not subject to self-employment tax. So the company's putting that in. I just converted. I pay income tax on it. Um, but I got a deduction anyways out of the business. So it's a wash without self-employment tax. So yeah. that, that, that's a little perk right there is just if you don't skip that. Yeah, yeah it's tricky. Um, one major tip here is when you're trying to find this, just take your time. You know, you never want to rush this process. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. the, the phones are lighting up. They want us to continue to explain this process. Is anyone but... listening still? Yeah, Is yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I got another one. Are you, are you ready? Okay. Who are we going? Dan Patella? I like Dan on the lease question. Okay. All right. Let's do that. So just hardcore contract work here. Okay. okay. I'll pose the question, Matt, then you answer. I had okay. just, I just signed a lease for the space of my, for my new business. We are opening a new custom automobile business. I purchased the name of the company from a franchise. Oh, there's so much there. He's saying I would state differently. Uh, yeah. He basically he bought a signed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you started, he bought into a franchise, not just the name, but yeah. anyway, that's okay, Dan. So he bought into a franchise. Let's think of Mako, you know, people, we all know Mako where they paint your cars. Um, I am currently doing all the build outs for the commercial space to be suitable for the business. Also, I had to travel to Florida to meet with the franchisor to do my trainings for my new business. Love it. My question is, what costs am I able to completely write off and what costs do I have to depreciate or amortize? Ooh, good one. Yeah. I like this. Okay. All right. Well, let's hit low-hanging fruit, Dan. So you're going to have a number of expenses that you're going to take 100% right now. You get expense, it's a write-off. Now you're going to have another category of ones that you're not going to be able to do that to that you're going to have to amortize or take over over time. So the easy ones are going to be all that travel that you had. Well, actually, you're not in business yet. He hasn't even started the business. I know. I was going to come in after and say, I think, yeah, we got to talk about the startup cost. Um, let's back up. Would that be okay if I explain yeah, that? Yeah, okay. Hit the startup cost. So 
You know better than I do. No, no, no. It's okay. Well, and I, I'd love to talk about this in the concept of a lemonade stand. Many of you have heard me talk about this at a workshop. Um, you go out and set up your table, you buy your ice, your lemonade, you get your sign built, you're ready to go. Are you in business yet? No. And let's think of now, Dan I'm here. Of the lemonade stands that buy ice, those are luxury. Yeah, yeah. I got ice, man. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a few warm glasses of lemonade this summer. I'm telling the kids, up your game. It's a recession ice. out here. They can charge extra for it. Yeah, I'm like, my mom said we don't get to give ice. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, but anyway, so think of Dan here. He's setting up his quote unquote lemonade stand. He's going to Florida to learn. He's building out the shop. Is he even serviced an automobile yet? He's in startup mode. Now, the scary part here is that if Dan has no business operations at all, every expense he incurs until he does his first service is going to be a startup cost unless it's equipment. And we're going to come back to lease and, leasehold improvements or equipment and things like that. But any of this travel costs or cell phone or computers or laptops and tape and anything that would normally be a supply or office to you know all these goodies dining buying pizzas for the guys working there building it out that's all a startup cost and until he has sells his first cup of lemonade those are going to go into a bucket you could write off five grand of those in immediately once you do your first service but the rest are amortized over 15 years we don't want that yeah i so, Matt, I think before you continue to talk about what's expensive and what's depreciable, I, I think one of the key strategies here, Dan, is open up shop in your garage. I mean, like literally do a project in your garage. Get someone's car in there and change out their tires, jack up their car somehow and mess it up, do whatever, change their oil, have a service. And you're like, well, the franchise, I haven't opened up the franchise. No, 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 you're an auto body shop. Just because you slap the name of your franchise on the shop doesn't mean that's when you're in business. You're in business when you take your first dollar of service. So start doing some automobile repairs or services. So now you're out of that startup mode. And uh, I think that would be the key first strategy, man. Yeah, I mean, that'd be a great strategy. I don't know in your, you know, the history's already been written for you, Dan, on, on that. But maybe you did, maybe you had a little auto body and friends paying you to help work on, on their cars. You might want to be claiming that income um, as being part of the auto business. So, um, all right, well, let me hit. Um, well, now, hold on. We got to finish those questions, right? So, oh, the, so I, okay. So once you're out of startup mode, then any expense that would normally be dining, travel, supplies, um, telephone, operational things, those are 100% deductible because those are just mm -hmm. keeping the lights on, just kind of like daily yeah. business stuff. And for the franchise, like your royalty fee, your advertising fee, those are all going to be expense too. Yeah. And so, um, but your franchise fee that you paid the franchise yeah, or is amortized over 15 years. There's no way around that. And then any equipment you buy is going to be typically a three, five, seven, or 15 year schedule. And your accountant's got a, a book they'll go through with you and talk about the amortization schedule that fits the category of these different types of equipment, tools. Um, now, the leasehold improvements are also another thing that will be amortized over the life of the lease. So if you're putting in drywall or AC or uh, new flooring, who knows? So what you'd want to do is do what you've got to do, keep the cost down, but keep a really good schedule of all your expenses, and your accountant will go through with you and figure out what's deductible. Now, this year, too, you have what's called bonus depreciation. It's going to start changing and phasing out under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where a lot of these pieces of equipment or improvements, you might be able to bonus depreciate, which means depreciate all in one shot. You may have heard about 179. Mm -hmm. 179 is another way to write off equipment quickly, but you can only 179 up to the amount of income you have in a business. See, a bonus can drive you into a loss. 179 can only take you to zero. So most accountants use bonus and 179 in a combination manner. And so talk to your accountant, really be having conversations with them about this during the process. Keep good records. And number one, do some services. Open up shop right away and get out mm -hmm. of startup mode. All right, man, yeah. thanks. All right, okay, we got a question here from Dean. He says, I recently formed an LLC 
and would like to be taxed as an escort. My research says I'm not eligible for escort tax savings this year as a window to apply ends March 15th. Is there a way to be taxed as an escort for the 2022 tax year? All right, Dean, we've got good news for you. There's an exception to these rules out there. It's called the RevProc. And there's a certain number after the RevProc, I forget what it is, but you're going to be able to go back to the date that LLC was formed where you can make an S selection on it. There's a procedure if you call, call our office, we do S selections for clients all the time on LLCs. And we can't go back before the LLC was set up. We can at least go back in time to when the LLC was set up, whenever that was this year. Um, so you can get S selection treatment and S corp tax status treatment at LLC for 2022. Love it. Good stuff. Okay. Um, all right. You want me to hit? I got another I'm one gonna, you want me to go for? I'm going to go with Timothy. It's a quickie. Um, he says, I love okay. your show. Most taxpayers can no longer deduct moving expense, but can you deduct a portion if you have a home office? Um, that's a really good question, Tim, or Timothy. I, wow. Um, okay, everybody, let's get the facts on the table. Uh, up until um, 2018, when we got the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, Every, uh, average Americans with their personal moving expenses could put a portion of them on a Schedule A. Um, and there was an itemized deduction for moving expenses. Well, in trying to simplify the tax return and increase the standard deduction, these got wiped out. The only, the only individual that could take the moving deduction were mil active military duty personnel that had a, to make a move of greater than 50 miles. They could take that right off. Other than that, none of us could do uh, any sort of personal moving expense. But Matt, this is good. He says, what if I'm moving and yeah. I have a business? If I move my business, is that a personal move expense? Nope. Yeah. So the expenses on a move of my company are right off. Yeah. So what about... Yeah, it's going on your Schedule C. <laughs> Or on your company's return, depending on what it is, it's not going on, you know, Schedule A or wherever the moving expenses go on your 1040. So, yeah, I I think the process here would be everybody. Let's say that you're looking at the home office deduction, which we're a firm believer in. It's not a high risk item. Don't listen to your accountant. So let's say your home is 10% home office. What I'm, I love I'm, how you you're an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not don't listen to your account <laughs> yeah, don't listen to your don't listen to your scared scaredy cat accountant you can listen to us we're good accountants okay <laughs> all right so let's say your home is 10 percent home office so if you take the the more i guess robust or the the standard home office deduction you're going to take 10 percent of your Mortgage interest, 10% of utilities, and da-da-da-da-da. And so that would carry out that if you're going to move your home and relocate your home office at the same time to this new home, wherever it is, then 10% of your moving costs would be a business expense on your business return, whether, like Matt said, Schedule C or 1120S or whatever it is. And so, uh, and if there was specific costs related to the home office, maybe some networking, some uh, high, you know, higher end equipment that need a special moving. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's great. I would take it, but on the business return, not on your person. Yeah. I like it. Very Love good. It. Um, all right. Bo Fala, Mr. Bo Fala asks, hello, gents from Arizona. I have mm -hmm. formed an LLC in Texas through KKOS. Thank you, Bo. Thank you. For rental property there. And we'll be setting up one in Arizona for rentals as well. We have now this is Bo, your question gets a little complicated here. So it says we eventually want to form a holding or a managing company. Now, those are two different things here, just so yeah. you know, clear. That would be the single member to all of our LLCs. Let's come back to that too, because I want to talk about what that what that means. And we'll likely have four members or partners in the new company with varying equity stakes. Oh my god. All right. Okay, Bo. Bo. Okay. Next Slow slide. down here. <laughs> Do you recommend forming an LLC or an LP for this management company? Oh my gosh. Thank you for the time it's here like laughing here is you're all over the place with this wow. question. This is wow. tricky. Okay. 
Well, we're going right. to unpack now, it. Do you want to un- say what you're doing right now? Yeah, let's unpack this. Okay. I like what you're doing. You have you formed an LLC for re- in Texas for rental property there. Okay. Check. Starting that's off good. Strong. You yeah. also have some rentals. Yep, that's good. You're setting up the LLC in the state where you got the properties. You're also doing an Arizona LLC for the rentals in Arizona as well. Great. Okay. And then you say we eventually want to form a holding or managing company. Let's talk about the difference between a holding and a managing company. Yeah. See, a hold company is going to own the, the, the business entity, or let's say in this sense, the property entity that owns the property. So I've got my holding company that I own, or you, you and partners could own. I got the holding company. That holding company doesn't own assets. It doesn't own a property directly. It doesn't do business directly. It just owns another company that then goes out and owns a property. Okay. Now the purpose right. of that before That's we get to ma- yeah and before we get to managing <clears throat> a holding the purpose of a holding company it, there's several but the yeah. biggest one is is creating another layer of asset protection so you're typically you're going to set up this holding LLC in a state that has what's called cope protection charging order protection entity protection which is a a next level type asset protection. In my tax and legal playbook, I will hold it up for the camera here, shameless plug. Uh, I have a whole mm-hmm. chapter on COPE entities. So you'd want to figure out which state would be best for that. So that COPE entity would hold these other LLCs that actually own the property. The other benefit is kind of simplicity. You've got all these LLCs flowing into one, maybe one tax return at that point. And for audit protection, a lot of clients make that holding company a two-member LLC, so it's on a 1065. So it's going to do its own separate tax return. So you're getting audit protection, simplicity, better asset protection, but that's the purpose of a holding entity. And let me say, I'll just add on that for you, Bo, because you didn't start talking about partners later on here. Four (sighs) partners? Okay, well, you might have those four partners all own the holding company, and that holding company owns the property entities, which then owns the property. So you have one holding company, one partnership tax return, owning the separate property entities. Now I know Bo throws a, a curveball here because he's got, we've got varying equity stakes. Okay, well, that's not going to work. I'm just saying for everyone else, if, if you had like four partners, like, hey, let's go in 25%. We're going to go on a bunch of property. You may have the one holding company you're all partners in that owns a property entity that owns a property. This one owns the Texas one. Then it owns the Arizona one and the whatever. That could yeah. be a strategy. Yeah, I was going to go to the whiteboard, but that's only benefits our YouTube crowd. So we'll just go, we'll kind of stay here on a verbal description. I I think what I see more often, Bo, and for all of you listeners, is that when you have varying equity stakes, what he's saying is Matt and I are going to be partners on one rental in Texas, maybe 50-50, but then in an Arizona property, we might be 75-25. 75 for me, 25 for Matt. But in that situation, we might change, we might have different ownership percentages of the actual entity that holds the property. That's easier. And then I have my own holding company for asset protection. Matt has his own company for asset protection. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to do that either. This is based on the amount of real estate you have and operations and, and wealth, because we don't need to go to this next level unless you really need it. But when you do, I would say that's more typical. You deal with property ownership stakes at the property level, not at the yeah. parent. Level. Yeah, and that's what, and that's why all these strategies and structures are different depending on the factors and the facts you have. So, Bo, in your scenario, you might be doing just separate property entities. You may not be bringing in a holding company at all because of these different varying ownership stakes you're going to have. You're going to be doing different partnership tax returns. But if that's the way you guys are cutting your deals and doing your deals, that that's that's how the entities are going to break down. Now, I want to talk about the managing entity. Okay. Um, now, you might have a management entity. We don't necessarily do that in all of our structures, particularly for real estate deals. Where I do like to do a managing entity is, let's say you're buying an apartment building. You're buying a bigger asset. Maybe you're raising capital and you have a fund. And so you have a management entity involved. Um, generally, though, we're just going to list you guys as the managers or maybe one or two of you, if you're more actively involved, just personally as the managers, um, or it could be a personal entity of yours, but you could form a management company if you wanted. Um, but just remember if there's four partners, that's another partnership tax return. All right. Plus you've got the partnership tax return for the property holding entity itself. 
So it's going to increase your administrative costs and your expenses. Also, your audit risk, because now you got another return here with all these other partners in it. Yeah, and Jack, can we go to the whiteboard? Could you put that up here? So for those of you that catch this show on YouTube, and if you want to, you can take the show number from the podcast and uh, plug it right into YouTube, and you'll see it. It's on my channel. Uh, the Directed IRA podcast is on Matt's YouTube channel. The Main Street podcast is on my Mark Kohler channel. So you'll, you shouldn't have a hard time finding it. So if you want to watch this diagram, I think it's just easier to show it this way. We've got this holding company down on the right that would be our COPE that you and your spouse, or if it's just you, your trust might be the 100% owner or it might be you and your spouse. So the two little people down here. Then these little sub entities, and I'm not talking about a sub series LLC, but <coughs> excuse me, but these other little LLCs. The old fashioned subsidiary. Yeah, little good old fashioned subsidiaries could be LLCs in other states. And you're going to have differing owners over here. So if you're watching on, if you're just listening, I'm designing multiple little bubbles that are above your holding company that are just kind of falling into your holding company by, based on your ownership percentage. Now, the only reason, and I'd say this all the time, for a management company, LLC, is that if over on the left side of your equation, you want to do one thing, and that is have a Roth solo 401k. You've been dying to have a solo 401k, but you don't have an operational business. All you've got is rental property. And so you go, I'm going to set up what I call the side door 401k. So you're going to kind of set up this management company over on the side that's going to sponsor a 401k because your passive income from these um, rental properties cannot fund a 401k. You've got to have this little management company. So this little managing company is really useless from an asset protection standpoint. And you might hear companies out there try to set these up in Nevada for you, and I, I think it's a scam. I don't think it, it helps. Maybe it helps you 1%. It's nowhere near worth the cost yeah. you pay for it. And that's my personal opinion. Yell, write me a nasty email if you want, people. You know who you are. But this managing LLC is going to, the sole purpose is to fund this 401k, and you zero it out. You're just going to, from your holding company, the one you own, not the one with your partners, you're going to pay a management fee over here and then just wipe it out with a, manage, with a 401k thing and a W-2 and blah, 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 and my handwriting sucks today, and then you're going to zero this thing out. So it's really, a, it creates actually better tax write-offs. You get a 401k out of the mix, but that's the only reason I'd set up a managing company. Yeah, that was a great one. Love it. Okay, now... Um, LP. Okay. Oh, yes. We got to talk about LP. Okay. LP stands for limited partnership. Okay. LPs right. are kind of old school. LPs were around before LLCs. And so LPs kind of turn into the partnership entity of choice. You have corporations and limited partners, partnerships, LPs. The thing about an LP is, is it requires a limited partner and a general partner. Limited partners don't have liability general partners take liability for the entity. Now, usually if any sophisticated parties using an LP, the general partner in an LP owns like 1% or less and is another entity itself, like another LLC. So it doesn't have any liability because you get the LLC's liability protection. So LPs though, in general, we're, we rarely use them. We're gonna go LLC for property holding entities, much easier. One thing in real estate deals, LPs in particular, is it's hard to take losses out of an LP and use them to offset your other income. There's passive activity loss restrictions in LPs that LLCs don't have. So if you're actively involved in your real estate, um, or even if you're just, you know, you're just buying single family rentals out here, big deals, small deals, um, the LP is going to limit your ability to take losses. Matt said it perfectly. And the only time I'd like to see LPs is on a property. So they're good for properties, but non-income producing properties. So like if this is the family ranch or the family cabin or the family beach house. It's something you want to keep. A, it's like a legacy property. There's no losses yeah. coming out of it. You're not Airbnb in it. There's no depreciation. It's not like your rental portfolio. So it's this, I, we really see it with farms and ranches and these beach houses yeah. or lake houses, lake cabin things. And then what you do is gifting. 
you're going to, the clients that use the LPs put a legacy property in it, and then they start gifting yeah. pieces of it off every year or two through an appraisal and gifts, and they're trying to get around estate tax. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's cool. when we see it the most. So, Yeah, and that's usually called an FL, FLP, Family Limited Partnership. Yeah. But there's also FLLCs, Family Limited Liability Companies. Yeah. And that's for people who have a 10 million plus estates that, like Mark said, are doing the gifting strategy. Otherwise, the only other people using LPs are maybe some people in funds, like hedge funds or private equity funds or stuff, where they don't care about passive activity loss rules because you're just an investor, you don't get them anyways. Um, or just kind of an old school crowd of people out there that just haven't caught on to the cool LLC craze. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, Jack, you can turn right. my whiteboard off. Thanks, man. All right. You want to take one more question and I'll take one too. Okay. All right. My last question will be quick here. Um, I've got, this was from Rod and it was an IRA question and he says, love the show. So I had to take it, Rod. Okay. Uh, remember though, if you got your IRA questions, get over directedira.com slash podcast. You can submit your questions there. We'll hit those on the directed IRA podcast, but um, this is a good one. I think for everyone, he says, um, I was under the impression you could contribute 6,000 to a traditional IRA and 6,000 to a Roth IRA. But it seems I was mistaken and it's either 6K to either one or a combination of 6K to both. If this is the case, then that means I over-contributed for last year. I haven't filed 2021 taxes yet. What do I do now? All right, great question, Rod. What you have found out is correct. You can only do 6,000 in total to IRAs for yourself. So this could be 6,000 to a Roth or 6,000 to traditional, or you could break it up between the two, as you said, for a combination of 6,000 total. Now, if you got a spouse, of course, your spouse could be doing 6K as well. Now, if you've over-contributed here, and that's what this is called, Rod, you've put in six to your traditional and six to your Roth, you're going to need to pull six out. Now, I would pull six out of the traditional, and you can do this without penalty um, since you haven't filed your taxes in 2021. So, um, I presume you've extended. So, what you'll need to do is contact IRA custodian. We do these at Directed IRA for clients that have to deal with this. It happens to all of us. Don't feel bad, Rod. This is a common thing. So whether you're at Charles Schwab or Fidelity or Directed IRA, they, you know, they'll be able to help you get that back out. And then now you're going to get a 1099, but you're going to be able to put it on your return and saying this was an over contribution prior year. It's not taxable to you. Now, if you made some money on it, though, you will pay tax on that. That will be taxable. So let's say that 6K turned into 7K. You will have to pay some tax on that. If you lost some money, let's say it was in the market that's now down. You know, I don't know that you get to take that loss. Actually, I'm pretty sure you don't. But if you made a little money, you do have to pay a little tax on the difference coming back up. All right. Great comment. Um, last question for I'll take is uh, from Brandon. And he has a three-part question. It, it sounds like it's a lot, but I'm going to truncate his question for everybody's benefit here so that hopefully someone gets something out of this. The first question is on a fixed-term charitable remainder unit trust. Um. I'm just going to say this, Brandon, to you and anyone out there. I have, I've never even met someone or an advisor that have set one of these up because they just they 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 exist in concept. But I want my clients want money for the rest of their life, and they want to be able to control the investments inside their CRUT, their General Rainer Unit Trust, and they don't want this fixed term that is at the end it dies and. They're still alive, but their trust is gone and the money has gone to a charity. So I, I, I don't know the answer on how to design a flip, crut, eight-year fixed-term structure. I probably have some referrals for you, but I know even the experts I know would be scratching their head, not only on how to do it, but why. So don't be offended. I, I think you're going to just enjoy the standard crut and get the benefit of that income disbursement for the rest of your life. That, and you can give it away if you want every year, but have it there just in case. Number two, he says, I want to sell premiums on option contracts, um, basically naked equity option contracts inside a CRT, but it requires a margin account, which means debt. And you're not able to secure that margin account with a personal guarantee. Um, and most charitable trust advisors are not going to allow you to enter into debt inside the CRT, especially a, certainly no sort of personal guarantee. And then you're going to have UBIT and, and unrelated business income tax because of UDFI. It's a, I've just, again, I've never even seen it. I would, st you're asking really, really complex high-end questions that I think 
take place in some conceptual context, but I've never even seen them before. So don't be offended. That's just, just being real. Now, I love his third question. <laughs> this is what I know I can answer. <laughs> Finally throws me a softball. He says, you have talked extensively about the power of creating side hustles and side businesses. Yes. Uh, but after these companies serve their purpose, what is the strategy for shutting down the business? If there's nothing more to sell or I'm done doing my contracting or I'm done being a landscaper or a service provider or I'm done selling widgets, what do I do with the business? He says, for example, a family farm or a fishing pond that I no longer want to use as a business. Is there anything I need to, that needs to be done or can I just, or can it just sit as a dormant business? Yes, there's something that needs to be done and I would not leave it as a dormant business. Um, first, let me say on, at the most simple level, you would just check the box, last return, it's done. There's no more income coming in, it's over. Usually at this point, you've drained the bank account. If you have an LLC or a corporation, you're gonna follow the articles or the, organ the bylaws or the articles of organ uh, the operating agreement and the articles on how yeah. the steps take place for that particular business. So you're just gonna wind it down, is called. You're gonna sell any assets, close any bank accounts, and on the final tax return, when there's no more income, you just check the box, final return. Now, I will say this, and accountants out there are cringing with my simple answer, is that if you have assets in this entity mm. and you want to distribute them to yourself, so you've got a leftover forklift, you have a leftover truck or a leftover copy machine or something, if, there are, if you've depreciated it, which I'm assuming you have, and there's any more useful life on that asset based on the de depreciation schedule your accountant set up, then you have to recapture that depreciation. It's kind of like you're taking it out of the business before it was fully, its useful life had expired. Now, if you have assets that their useful life's expired, you've already depreciated the hell out of it, you're going to be able to distribute those. Um, but there's different rules, again, for S corporations, C corporations, sole proprietorships. Um, but, but it isn't difficult. You just have to have a conversation with your accountant, look at the balance sheet, What's on the books? Uh, nine times out of 10, you're not going to have any taxable income, but you do need to do some journal entries and just shut it down. It's good stuff. Yeah. So let me just, let me just do a quick summary on that. Dissolve with the state. If you have an entity, mm. file a final return with the IRS. And if you have assets in there, equipment, real estate, things like that, know there might be some tax consequences in getting those assets out because you're personally going to take and own those assets now from the business. So there could be some tax consequences there. But we definitely like being more organized about it, winding it down, shutting it down. Don't think you can just like walk away and that it's like it, it automatically winds down. In fact, a lot of times you're going to get state fees and you're going to get notices and the IRS is going to start sending you stuff and being like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Um, you want to be organized about it, shut yeah. it down the right way. And it, this is a deeper issue, Brandon. When you break off a relationship, you need to have a conversation. You know, you just don't ghost someone. That's not appropriate, right? You, you, you got to tell them what yeah. happened. You get, the IRS is out there. They're wondering what happened to Brandon. What, what, he just ghosted me. I thought we had a great relationship here. He was taking me yeah. out every year with a tax return. He was spending enough money every year. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he was, he was a sugar daddy for me. I mean, he, we were making money off Brandon and now he's just gone. They want some, clo <laughs> they need closure, Brandon. Yeah. You need to have that exit interview. But the nice thing them. is they don't make a hard, you just got to check the box. Yeah. That's all you got to do. It. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> don't, don't leave you me. You want to back up with me? Yes, yeah. no. Check the box. And, and I'll tell you, it, it's not going to go well if you just ghost them. Your car could end up getting keyed. Um, there might be some eggs thrown at your house. I mean, you never know. Uh, and yeah. you, you don't, IRS version of keying your car, egg in your house is putting a lien on your house. A federal <laughs> tax lien on your house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, do, do the respectable thing. You know, let them down easy. Tell them what happened. And, and, and part ways, amicably. Mm -hmm. You never know when you might bump into them again. Yeah. All right. Well, you've got a thank. You. That was really profound. You've got an yeah, ongoing relationship with the IRS. You're going to, you're going to have to talk to him again. Yeah. They, yes. you know? <laughs> That's true. You never fully break up with them. It's just, yeah, yeah. You're just changing relationship. Well, yeah. We're just not you're going gonna out on Friday nights friend. anymore. <laughs> yeah. You're still going to be friends. All right. Yeah. We're just friends. You know what, IRS? It wasn't you. It was me. I, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> I decided You're to show me. It's not you. It's me. I invented. Yeah. I invented that. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> okay, you're right. It's you. It's yeah. you. You're damn now, right. Then, it you is. Could, then it gets even worse if you try to pull off the roommate switch. You know, you might say, "I'm going to go from the U.S. and I'm going to get taxed in the United Kingdom. I'm going to move teams." I mean, oh, I mean, the IRS is not. It's hard to pull off. I mean, no one in the no history of man. <laughs> Possibly oh my gosh. There. Yeah. Um, Boy, well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. yeah, we covered a lot of territory here. We appreciate you guys being on. Next week, we'll be back with another amazing episode, the Main Street Business Podcast. And if you got questions, we've got answers. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're halfway decent. Sometimes they're terrible. But we got answers. Um, but get over to MainStreetBusiness.com. You can submit your questions. And um, we'll be have another open forum in just a few weeks. And until then, stay calm. Happy 4th of July weekend. Yeah. Go America. I don't know. Go America. Love that. All right. See you yeah. next week, folks. Till then.